Welcome to Altair Engineering Training and Support. I am Apoor Bapat. Welcome you all in Baha SA India 2016 online training sessions. So as we have covered day one that is 2D meshing, geometry editing and the analysis to be done on the roll cage. Then uh, on day two that is today we will see torsional rigidity and bending stiffness. Calculation and concept behind it why it is required for roll cage and concept and theory of FE and CA and then we will see day 3, day 4 and day 5 in the uh, next 3 days. So I will start with uh, today's session that is torsional rigidity and bending stiffness and concept and theory of FE and CA. So again we will start with uh, Optistruct as the user profile. I am going to open the same file which I have uh, solved during this last time. So I will open that same file where I have torsional force and bump force. So we will see the results of these. So I will directly open Hyperview. So I will directly jump to torsional analysis. So this is the results of torsional analysis and then I will jump directly to the bump analysis results. So this is the means this is the results of displacement for bump analysis. So the bending stiffness, the bending stiffness of a roll cage can be calculated as force at each point or in this case force at each suspension mounting point divided by the vertical displacement of each point. So I have to find out the vertical displacement of each and every point where I have applied the forces. So how can I do that? So I will jump into this. So these are the area where I have applied the force. So I will calculate the total force at this point and I will try to find the vertical displacement of this point. So how I can do that? So I will go to measure panel, add one more thing, add these things, the Y displacement. So I'll arbitrarily add some of the points. Say for example this. So here you can see it is showing me the vertical displacement of Y that is minus that is 6.613 you can see here the magnitude is the global displacement and this is my Y displacement. So at this point whatever the force I have applied I will divide that force with this to find the bending stiffness of this point. Similarly, I will add the bend values of all these points and take out the average. So that is that will be the average bending stiffness of my roll cage. That is the most important thing because the bending stiffness of the roll cage should not be more than the bending stiffness of the suspensions. 
So our aim is to have a lighter roll cage. So the lighter roll cage can be designed. The major factor to design a lighter roll cage is if the bending stiffness of roll cage is more than the bending stiffness of suspensions, then we should we we have a chance to reduce the weight of the suspend uh, weight of the roll cage by removing some of the other members, which is not playing major role in the bending uh, stiffness. So that the bending stiffness should come below the bending stiffness of the suspension. So in this way, we can calculate the bending stiffness of the roll cage. Now, to next step is we will try to calculate the torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness of my roll cage. So why I am calculating the torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness of the roll cage is the its general concept for Baha roll cage is my torsional rigidity whatever it comes for the roll cage should be at least 10 times of the roll stiffness which is coming in the suspension because of the suspension whatever the roll stiffness is coming that my uh, roll cage torsional rigidity should be 10 times of the uh, roll stiffness of suspension so say for example my roll stiffness is coming as 130 or 140 so my torsional rigidity should be at least 1200 or 1300 minimum the 10 times of whatever the roll stiffness is so we have to calculate what is the torsional rigidity of the roll cage to calculate the torsional rigidity or of the roll cage the formula for it or first we will know we should know the uh, unit of it so it is newton mm per degree is the torsional rigidity so how we can calculate it so uh, we can calculate the degree using 10 theta which will be perpendicular upon base so that we can calculate the theta we can calculate the torque by the formula as force in the right hand side divided by 2 plus force in the left hand side divided by 2 multiplied by the total distance will be the torque between these two forces the total distance between these two forces will be my torque and the torsional rigidity is torque divided by the angle which I have calculated will be my torsional rigidity or torsional stiffness so now I will show you how to calculate it so first thing is I have to calculate the 10 theta so I will calculate at each node and then I will take the average of all these and find the torsional stiffness or torsional rigidity for the entire roll cage so here if I turn on my torsional data so I have applied a force here so I will try to find the node ID of it so go to tools numbers for this particular node my ID is 15396 so now I will try to find the vertical displacement of so I will try apply this first for torsional now go to measures add distance or relative displacement by ID it is 15396 6 ok and I want Y so my Y displacement for this point is coming as 14 that is the perpendicular now for the base if I see if I put it like this 
or here if I put it like this, I will turn off. To calculate the 10 theta, if I assume this is like this, so this is the point where I am applying the force. This is my center point. So because of torsion stiffness, my one point will go down my one point will go up. So if I plot a graph something like this, so this is my straight line and it will be like this. So this is my center point. This is the distance. This is my base. So 10 theta is equals to perpendicular upon base. So I know the perpendicular now. So my perpendicular is 14.126 and to calculate the base, you can calculate the base using the distance between these two points. So press F4. So we can calculate the distance between this point. And this point which is coming as 5, 2, 3. Here you can see the distance is coming as 5, 2, 3. So if I turn on the calculator. So I have to calculate the base which is 523 divided by 2, which is 261.5, will be the my base. So, now I have a perpendicular, I have a base, so I can calculate 10 theta and then after that I can calculate theta using the formula. Now, to calculate torque, I'll show you how you can calculate the torque. Torque will be force of this point. So I will calculate the force which is minus 10. Whatever the force you have will be the force. So <clears throat> minus 10 at 1 So, this plus the force at the other end. So, 5 plus 5, the force I have applied equal. So, 10 by 2 is 5. I have applied minus 10 to select the direction. Force cannot be negative. It's a direction base. So, I have applied a force in negative y-axis. So, if, if you can see here, I cannot apply A force in negative x, y, z. So that's why I put a magnitude of minus. So you cannot put a magnitude minus uh, in calculation. So for calculation you have right force divided by 2. So my right force is 10 divided by 2 is 5 plus left force by 2. So left force also will be the 10 divided by 2. So 5 plus 5 will be 10 and the distance between the two points. So my distance between the two points I have already calculated which is 538. So 538. So this is my torque in Newton mm. So this divided by degree what I have calculated earlier will be my torsional stiffness and the torsional stiffness should be 10 times of the roll stiffness of my suspension. So in this way, I calculate the torsional stiffness and or torsional rigidity and bending stiffness of my roll cage chassis. This helps me to design my a lighter roll cage chassis uh, 
and will help me uh, to reduce the overall weight of the roll of my ATV. So in this way, I have, I have completed with the torsional rigidity and the bending stiffness calculation. So now we will move to the next thing that is the theory and concept behind CA and FEA. So we'll start with the introduction to meshing. That is the first question is why do we carry out meshing? So uh, the basic idea of FEA is to make calculation at only limited number of points and then interpolate the results for the entire domain, surface or volume. Any continuous object has infinite degrees of freedom and it's just not possible to solve the problem in this format. Finite element method reduces the degrees of freedom from infinite to finite with the help of discretization or meshing. That's why to have a calculation at limited number of points, you can see a body has infinite number of points and we can calculate the values at infinite number of points, but that is not practically possible. So to calculate the values at limited number of points, we create nodes. With the help of those nodes, we create elements and then we can interpolate the results to the entire domain. That's why we carry out meshing. Now, the types of elements used in CA is 1D, 2D, 3D. So, we'll see when to use 1D elements. When one of the dimension is very, very large as compared to other two, we use 1D elements. The element shape is line. Additional data from the user required is remaining two dimensions that is the area of cross section element types available in 1d is rod bar beam pipe axisymmetric shells etc practical applications where 1d elements can be used are long shaft beam pin joints connection elements etc 2d elements uh, can be defined as this definition are for 2d elements so two of the dimensions are very, very large in comparison to the third one. Shape of the element is quadrilateral or triangular. Additional data from the user is remaining dimension that is the thickness. Element type is thin shell plate, membrane, plane stress, plane strain, axisymmetric solids, etc. Practical application is sheet metal part, plastic components like an instrument panel, etc. Then 3D elements, all the dimensions are comparable. Element shape is tetra, penta, hexa and pyramid. Additional data from the user is none. Element type is solid and practical application is transmission, casing, engine block, crankshaft, etc. Then how to decide element type? What type of element we should use in which type of, uh, on which type of model? So the basic idea, there are three points you should consider before selecting element uh, type. First is geometry size and shape. Second is type of analysis. Third is time allotted for the project. So for an analysis, the software needs all three dimensions defined. It cannot make calculations unless the geometry is defined completely by meshing using nodes and elements. The geometry can be categorized as 1D, 2D or 3D based on the uh, dominant dimension and then the, the type of the element is selected accordingly. 1D element used for geometries having one of the dimension is very very large in comparison to the other two. The shape of the 1D element is 9. When the element is created by connecting two nodes, the software know about only one out of three dimensions. The remaining two dimensions, the area of cross section must be defined by the user as additional input data and assigned to the respective elements. Practical example is long shaft, rod, beam, column, spot welding, bolt joints, pin joints, bearing modeling, etc. Then 2D elements used when two of the dimensions are very very large in comparison to the third one. 2D meshing is carried out on a mid surface of a part. 2D elements are planar just like paper. By creating 2D elements, the software knows two out of three, I mean, three required dimensions. The third dimension thickness has to be provided by the user as an additional input data. Why is 2D meshing carried out on a mid surface? Mathematically, the element thickness specified by the user is assigned 
half on the element top and half on the element bottom side hence in order to represent the geometry appropriately it is necessary to extract the mid surface and then mesh on the mid surface practical uh, examples are all sheet metal parts plastic components like instrument panels etc in general 2d meshing is used for parts having a width to thickness ratio greater than 20 limitations of mid surface and 2d meshing 2d meshing would lead to higher approximation if used for variable part thickness surfaces are not planar and have different features on two sides then 3d meshing used when all the three dimensions are comparable its practical applications are transmission casing clutch housing engine block connecting rod crankshafts etc then the next thing is based on the type of analysis for structural and fatigue analysis quad hex elements are preferred over trias tetras and pentas for crash nonlinear analysis priority to mesh flow lines and brick elements over tetrahedron mold flow analysis triangular elements are preferred over quadrilateral dynamic analysis when the geometry is borderline between the classification of 2d and 3d geometry 2d uh, 2d ele shell elements are preferred over 3d this is because shell elements are being less stiffer capture the mode shape accurately and with a fewer number of nodes and elements time allotted for project when time is not constrained the appropriate selection of element mesh flow line and a good mesh quality is recommended sometimes due to very tight deadline the analyst is forced to submit the report quickly for such situation automatic or batch meshing tools could be used instead of time consuming but structured and good quality providing method for 3d meshing tetras are preferred over hexas if the assembly of several component is involved and only the critical parts are meshed appropriately other parts are either coarse meshed or represented approximately by 1d beam spring uh, concentrated mass etc now the next question is can we solve same problem using 1d 2d and 3d elements it is not possible to use 3d elements for long slanted beams 1d geometry for sheet metal parts 2d geometry and 2d shell elements for representing big casing parts the same geometry could be modeled using 1d 2d 3d elements what matter is the number of elements and nodes the accuracy of result and the time consumed in the analysis for example consider a cantilever beam with a dimension of 250 25 mm that is subjected to a 35 newton force the number of nodes you can see here is increased drastically but the displacement and stress value is comparable in both the three cases then how to decide element length based on previous experience with a similar type of problem type of analysis linear static analysis could be easily carried out quickly with large number of nodes and elements but crash nonlinear cfd or dynamic analysis take a lot of time keeping control on number of nodes and element is necessary hardware configuration and graphics card capacity of the available computer an experienced ca engineer knows the limit of node that can satisfactorily handle with the given hardware configuration suppose you are a part of newly formed ca group no clear guidance are available and there is no experienced person in the group in the first run accept the default element length mesh with the basic rules then run the analysis and observe the high stress region remesh the localized area of high stresses with small element length and solve again compare the difference in the original and new results continue the process until convergence is achieved 5 to 10 percent difference in the strain energy or maximum stress value can be if once you have achieved this you can achieve the convergence <clears throat> now we will see how to start meshing so my first point is uh, spend a sufficient amount of time studying the geometry a common 
uh, observation is that CA engineer starts meshing immediately without properly understanding the geometry and paying attention to all the requirements and instructions provided. Observing the geometry several times and thinking about it from all the angles is strongly suggested. Mental visualization of the step is the first step in the right direction of creating a good machine. Time estimation. Nowadays, the trend is towards the client or boss specifying the estimated time of a given job to the service provider or subordinates. Sometimes it is decided based on mutual understanding. A time estimation is very relative and one can find a lot of difference in estimation by different engineers. Usually a less experienced person will estimate more time. Also if someone is handling the job for the first time, then he she will require more time. If similar kind of jobs are given to the same engineer again and again, the mesh time would reduce drastically. Geometry check. Generally CAD data is provided in IGS format or IGS format. Geometry cleanup is an internal part of meshing activity. CA engineers should at least have the basic knowledge of CAD before starting the job. The geometry should be carefully checked for free edges, scar lines, duplicate surface, small fillets, small holes, beads, intersection of parts, assembly of the components. If suppressing fillets, small holes, beads, or the generation of mid surface is required for meshing, then why isn't the CAD data provided in the way needed for CA by the CAD engineer? Yes, theoretically that would be an ideal situation, but practically everyone works with a very tight schedule and the target dates. CAD data is generated keeping in mind the final drawing to be released for manufacturing. The same CAD model is provided simultaneously to tool and jig pictures manufacturers, vendors, purchase engineer and CA engineer etc. The simplification required for FEA is understood better by a CA engineer than a CAD engineer. Hyperworks software provides special tools for geometric cleanup and simplification which are usually much faster than CAD software. Many times a complicated geometry Surfacing operation fails in CAD software but it can easily be handled by CA engineers by avoiding the geometry and generating the mesh using manual or specific mesh operations. Then symmetric check. Complete part symmetry. Meshing only a quarter of a plate and reflecting it twice is advisable. Sub part symmetry. Repetition of features and the copy paste command meshing the highlighted to 22.5 degree portion and then using reflection and rotation would lead to faster mesh as well as the same structure of elements and nodes around the critical areas. Selection of type of element. In real life, we rarely use only one type of element. It is usually a combination of different types of elements, 1D, 2D, 3D and other. In the below figure, the handle of the bucket is modeled in 1D. The bucket body use shell 2D elements and the connection between the handle and bucket body through RB2 that is the rigid element. Then type of meshing. It is geometry based. The mesh is associated to the geometry if the geometry is modified. The mesh will also get updated accordingly automatically. The boundary condition could be applied on the geometry like a surface or edge. FE based mesh is non-associative. The boundary conditions are applied on the element and nodes only. Then meshing in critical areas. Critical areas are location where high stress location will uh, occur. Dense mesh and structured mesh, no trials or pentas is recommended in these regions. Areas from the critical areas are general. Areas away from the critical areas are general areas. Geometry specification and coarse meshes in general areas is recommended to reduce the total degrees of freedom and solution time. How would I know about the critical area before carrying out an analysis? After going through a previous analysis of similar part, carried 
out by your colleague or a senior in the group, one can get a fair good idea, fairly good idea about the probable location of high stresses. But suppose there is no parts record, past records and you are doing it for the first time, then run the analysis with a reasonable element length and observe the result. High stress regions are critical and could be remeshed with a small element length in the second run. Rules for modeling holes and fillets. For critical area, minimum 12 elements around the hole. General area, 4 and 6 will do. For critical area, minimum 3 elements on fillet. In general, suppress small fillet, 1 element of for larger fillets. Mesh transition techniques and flow lines. 1, 2, 3, you can do that. Four, 2 to 4 and 1 to 2. Now, we will start with when to use 1D elements. When one of the dimension is very large in comparison to the other two, my element shape is line, additional data from the user is the remaining two dimension, that is the cross-sectional area. Element type is rod, bar, beam, axisymmetric cells, etc. Practical application is long shaft, beam, pin joints, connections, elements. Type of 1D elements are rod, it supports tension, compression and torque for same software that is UX and RX. Tension compression members stresses shaft subjected to torque connection element. Bar elements supports all six degrees of freedom applicable for symmetric cross section. Shaft subjected to multi axial loading, bolted, welded joints, connection elements. Beam element same as bar but also support unsymmetric cross sections that is shear center and warpage same as bar plus unsymmetric cross section. Then pipe element same as beam except it has internal non-zero diameter. Piping symmetric structural analysis and axisymmetric shell has uh, z axis of symmetry x as radial axis for objects symmetric about the axis of rotation and subjected to axial boundary condition thin shell pressure vessel cylindrical conical objects etc 2d meshing the 2d elements are used when two of the dimensions are very very large in comparison to the third dimension my element shape is quad additional data from the user remaining dimension that is the thickness element type is thin shell plate membrane plane stress plane strain axisymmetric solid etc practical application is sheet metal parts plastic components like instrument panel etc why is 2d meshing is carried out on the mid surface quite often the geometry of thin wall 3d structure as shown in the below image is simplified uh, to geometric model with a lower dimensionality this is typically called a mid surface model the mid surface model is then meshed with 2d element thus there is no need of detailed volume mesh as the thickness of the geometry is virtually assigned to the 2d elements mathematically the element thickness specified by the user is assigned with the half in positive z direction element top and the other half in the negative z direction that is element bottom. Type of 2D elements is tria and quad. So that is the first element uh, tria also known as constraint strain triangle. Then uh, second order which is having six nodes that is linear strain triangle similarly for quad four noted quad or eight noted quad so linear tri element or parabolic tri element linear quad element parabolic quad element are two types of tri uh, elements in 2d meshing now uh, some important topics in 2d meshing is how not to mesh Back to back triangles should be avoided. Two tri elements should not be connected to each other directly. One plane on a plane surface triangular element should be avoided. No mesh transition on constant radius fillets, curvatures. The mesh transition should be carried out on a planar surface. Avoid tria elements on the outer edge or holes. 
what is not acceptable at professional level and what is acceptable you can see here the different in the meshing circular holes should be modeled carefully with a washer 1.5 to 2.2 times the dia of the uh, holes and a minimum of two layers around the hole hole should be modeled with a even number of equal spaced elements for a better representation of hole geometry and smooth mesh low lines hole should be modeled with a even number of elements like 6 8 12 16 etc rather than 5 7 9 or 13 note should lie properly on the surface with no deviation or no kinks switch off the element lines and observe the con contour in particular at curvatures kinks as shown are not acceptable flow of the feature line note should lie exactly on the edge instead of zigzag disturbed distribution a structured or smooth mesh is recommended nodes align in a straight line use a smooth option provided by most of these commercial software helping in achieving symmetric mesh if a smooth option is not available then uh, try to remesh it and get a smooth line for crash analysis flow of the mesh flow line require requirement <clears throat> for crash analysis rotating quads are not allowed you can see these types of things are not allowed in crash then for crash analysis constant mesh line by using trias is preferred due to minimum element length and time step criteria now we'll move to the next topic that is when to use 3d elements 3d elements should be used when all the di dimensions are comparable element shape is tetra penta hexa and pyramid Additional data from the user is nothing. My element type is solid. Practical application is gearbox, engine block, crankshaft, etc. For types of 3D element is tetra. We have first order tetra element, second order tetra element, penta, first order penta element with six nodes, second order penta element with 15 nodes, hex elements, eight noded hexa elements or 20 noded hexa elements degree of freedom for solid element 2d thin shell and 1d beam element support 6 degrees of freedom but all solid elements only uh, elements have only three uh, translational degrees of freedom no rotational degrees of freedom that is a 10 noted tetra element has total 10 multiplied by 3 which is 30 degrees of freedom now the question is why does a solid element have only three translational and no rotational degrees of freedom. Consider a piece of paper <clears throat> that is 2D geometry or a long steel scale that is 1D geometry. It could be easily bent or twisted that is rotational degrees of freedom. But now consider a solid object like a duster or paper weight. It could not subject it to very high bending or torsional stiffness. Hence solid element have been formulated with three translational degrees of freedom and no rotational degrees of freedom. Now we will move to the next topic that is how not to mesh for 3D meshing. My mid nodes should lie exactly on the geometry. For a parabolic tetra meshing task, many CA engineers prefer to start with linear tria instead of parabolic meshing and then convert it into parabolic. In the conversion process, mid nodes might not get projected automatically on the curved surface and fillets. If so, it should be projected on corresponding surface before converging to tetras. When the object is split among several engineers, the element length and overall mesh pattern should be consistent. The above job was split among three engineers due to very short time duration provided by the client. The same mesh size and pattern was not followed by the engineers working independently on sub parts of the geometry. So you can see there is a huge difference in size of all the elements for the same part. Minimum two elements on the fillets of the tria meshing. 
element at the fillet and curved surface usually fails in the Jacobian. Distortion elements check. The manual adjustment of for improving the element quality results a mesh deviation from geometry and visible kinks. This could be avoided by mod modeling the fillet with two or more elements. For brick meshing, a minimum of two elements across the thickness should be used. A single element leads to poor interpolation and thus affects the accuracy of result. A minimum of two elements across any thickness is recommended. The acceptation is NVS application where stress is not the main criteria, but representation of mass and stiffness is the main criteria. Use of tetra pyramid element while brick meshing. Some clients allow for a few tetra elements during brick meshing. Also some software and analysis type supports pyramid elements. Use of tetras and pyramid elements can make the life of a brick mesher tolerable. It's good practice to clarify the instruction for the use of these elements from the client. Modeling a sheet metal part with 3D elements. For a sheet metal, a very small thickness part, 2D shell elements are better suited and recommended. It is not like we cannot use a 3D mesh, but it will result in very high number of nodes and elements. Consider the following sheet metal part, 200, 202. We will mesh the same part with 3D parabolic uh, tetra elements and 2D quad for linear element using the same element length and compare the number of nodes and elements needed. So you can see in a 3D the number of nodes is 1496 where in 2D the number of nodes is 121. So it is not required to have that much amount of nodes. The results will not vary much. Limitation of 1D element and advantages of 3D meshing. Fillet cutouts and complicated geometry features cannot be represented ac accurately by 1D elements. 3D elements because of 3 dimension can capture all the minute details accurately. For example, consider the following shaft. It is very difficult to capture the key base slot and variable fillet using 1D elements. Instead, 3D meshing is recommended for such applications. Now we will move to the elements quality and check. Element quality is subject often talked about and never fully understood. The reason for this is complex but is related to the fact that quality is relative and the solution by definition is approximate. In the formulation of finite element, a local parametric coordinate system is assumed for each element type and how well the physical coordinate system both the element and global match global match the parametric uh, dictates element quality. Below you see some graphics representation uh, representing elements quality and you should attempt to follow them. However, there will be a point of uh, diminishing returns if you try to hard to get very every element within the acceptable acceptance criteria. Your judgment is your only guide in those cases. Always perform quality check on the mesh you create. Check with local experts regarding the appropriate values of each element type required by your element checking computer program. Be aware that in this situation, correct answer can vary a great deal as illustrated in the following table, where the range between OK and very poor is quite wide. Solid elements use the determinant of Jacobian matrix and compare the ideal value. Some common element quality measures are detailed below. The best for trial element is 60-60-60. OK can be R trials or 1 is to 2. Very poor is 105 or 10 degrees. Similarly for quads, the range for best OK and very poor is given. Then we will go for skewness. Skew in tria is calculated by finding the minimum angle between the word vector from each node to the opposing mid-surf side and the vector between the two adjacent mid-sides at each node of element. 90 degree minus the minimum angle found is reported. 
skew in chord is calculated by finding the minimum angle between two lines joining opposite mid side of element 90 degree minus the minimum angle found is reported as skewness the skew check is performed in the same fashion on all faces of three dimensional element aspect ratio aspect ratio in two dimensional element is calculating calculated by dividing the minimum length side of an element by the minimum length side of the same element the aspect ratio check is performed in the same fashion for all faces of three dimensional element warp edge in two dimensional element is calculated by splitting a quad into two triads and finding the angle between two planes which the triad forms the quad is then split again this time using the opposite corner and forming the second set of triads the angle between the two planes which the triad formed is then found the maximum angle found between the planes is the warp edge of the element warp edge is the three dimensional element is performed in the same fashion on all the faces of the element 2d quality check idle shape of quad element is square idle shape of triangular element is equilateral tri triangle different quality parameters like skew aspect ratio included angles jacobian stretch etc are the measures of how far a given element deviates from the idle shape a square means that all the angles are 90 degree with equal sides while a equilateral triangle has all the angles at 60 degree with equal sides some of the quality checks are based on angles like skew and included angles while the others on side ratios and areas like expert ratio and stretch to reduce the solution time elements are mapped to local coordinate system individual for every element at the centroid instead of using a single coordinate system that is global the effectiveness of this transformation is checked by the jacobian or distortion ideally all the nodes of the quad element should lie on the same plane but because of curvature and complicated geometry profile that is not possible the measure of out of plane angle is warp edge so warp edge is the out of plane angle idle value is zero acceptable should be less than 10 degrees warp edge is not accept applicable for triangular elements it is defined as the angle between the normals of two planes formed by splitting the chord elements along the diagonals the maximum angle of the two possible uh, angles is reported as the warp edge angle aspect ratio maximum element edge divided by minimum element edge is aspect ratio idle value is 1 acceptable is less than 5 skew idle value is 0 acceptable is less than 45 skew for quadrilateral element is 90 minus the minimum angle between the two lines joining the opposite mid side of element that is alpha skew for triangle elements is 90 minus the minimum uh, angle between the lines form uh, from form each node to the opposing mid side and between the two adjacent mid sides at each node of the element jacobian idle value is 1 acceptable is greater than 0.6 in simple terms the jacobian is a scale factor arising because of transformation of the coordinate system elements are transformed from global coordinate systems to local coordinate defined at the centroidal of every element for faster analysis time included angle Skew is based on overall shape of the element it, it, and it does not take into account the individual angles of the quadrilateral or triangular element. Included or interior angles check is applied for individual angles. Quad idle value is 90, acceptable is 45 to 135. For tria idle value is 60, acceptable is 20 to 120. Minimum element length. This is very important check for crash analysis time step calculation. It is also applied in general to check for the minimum feature length captured and the presence of any zero length element. Chord deviation. This helps in determining how well curvatures have been modeled. It is defined as the distance between the mid nodes of an element edge to the curved surface. It is only applicable for linear elements.
how to improve quality of poor elements manual adjustment this is done by translating the nodes manually or remeshing in poor mesh region this method consumes lot of time and was the only technique available for years drag node the user has to drag the node of the failing element it works faster and the advantage is that it instantaneously shows the effect of dragging the node on all the attached elements auto quality improvement program this is the latest option of quality improvement the user has to submit the mesh for quality improvement and the software program runs in the background to improve the elements quality automatically other checks for 2d meshing element free edge what is free edge any single quad element has four edges two element in the case above the middle edge is shared and is no longer the free edge for a real life fe model free edge should match uh, with the geometry outer edge or free edge any additional free edge are an indication of unconnected nodes duplicate elements mistakes during operations like reflect or translate can result in duplicate elements these duplicate elements do not cause any error during the analysis but increase the stiffness of model and result in smaller displacement and stresses for example consider a single plate thickness 2 mm subjected to tensile load assume that due to the sum meshing operation all the elements are duplicated if the analysis is carried out then it should show half the stress and displacement duplicate nodes operation like copy translate orient or reflect can result in duplicate nodes uh, at common edge in the above image there is a duplicate node at the interface where the mesh was reflected the duplicate nodes are highlighted in yellow geometry deviation after the completion of meshing the geometry meshing the geometry the mesh and geometry should be viewed together mesh line options of the mesh should not deviate from the geometry delete free temporary nodes free nodes if not deleted results in rigid body motion when the auto singularity option is turned on the software uses a spring elements with a very small stiffness to connect the free nodes with the parent structure this results in warning message during the analysis <clears throat> renumber nodes elements property etc before export operation frequent import export operation could lead to a very large number of nodes and element ids some software refuse to read file if the node element ids are greater than specific limit this could be avoided by renumbering the nodes and elements etc observe type family number of elements element summary for complete model the mesh should be checked carefully prior to export operation as well as after importing it in the external solver for element type family member etc sometimes due to the translator problem if if properties are not defined properly or for non supportive element either the elements are not exported at all or the family is changed like membrane elements converted to thin shell etc plot trace line element free edge and free faces if any should be deleted check mass actual mass versus fe model mass when a prototype or physical model of a component is available the fe model mass should be compared with the actual mass a difference means that there is are missing or additional components or improper material or physical properties free free run or dummy linear static analysis before delivering the final mesh to the client a free free run should be performed six rigid modes indicate that all the parts in the assembly are properly connected at to each other in this in the case of single component meshing job a linear static analysis with dummy boundary condition should be carried out request your colleague to check the model due to continually working on the same project our mind tends to take some of the things for uh, granted and there is a possibility 
of missing some of the points. It is good practice to get the get it cross checked by your colleague prior to finally delivery. Quality checks for tetra meshing. Tet collapse. Idle value is one. Acceptable is greater than 0.1. Tet collapse is height multiplied by 1.24 divided by a. That is the area. So define as the distance of node from the opposite face divided by area of the face multiplied by 1.24. Other checks for tetra meshing. Quality checks for 2D tria elements before converting trias to tetra. All qualities checks as discussed for shell element should be applied. Free edge conversions from trias to tetras are possible only if, when there is no free edge. No free edge indicates the mesh is an enclosed volume. T connections. The mesh should not contain any T connections. Consistent shell normals. Before converting tria to tetra, the shell normal should be corrected. Some software do not allow shell to solid conversion unless the normals of each elements are properly aligned. Geometry deviations. After the completion of mesh, the geometry as well as the mesh flow should be viewed together. The mesh should not deviate from the geometry. In the process of quality improvement, uh, sometimes nodes get translated too far away from the geometry and it is not acceptable. 2D tria element should be deleted before final submission. It's a common mistake to export 2D shell elements along with tetra meshing in the final delivery. Brick mesh quality check. The ideal shape of brick element is Q. Various quality criteria check how far a given element deviates from the ideal shape. Warp edge, ideal value is 0. Acceptable is less than 30 degree. Jacobian, ideal value is 1. Acceptable is greater than 0.5. Aspect ratio, ideal value is 1. Acceptable is less than 5. Quad face included angles 45 to 135. Trial face included angle is 20 to 125. Percentage of pentas less than 5% is acceptable. Other quality checks for brick meshing is three faces. A three face check is the most important check for brick meshing. A single brick element has six free faces. Three faces of the mesh should match with the outer surface of the solid part. Any extra face for indicate the, that either nodes are not connected properly or there are mismatching elements. Converting three faces to tetras. For complicated geometries, checking the internal face should, be, uh, should consume a lot of time. A quick shortcut to convert the free face to tetra mesh successful conversion indicate that the mesh the brick mesh is okay and there is no internal faces material property information material classification isotropic means uh, property independent of direction or axis two independent constant e and nu it's for metal orthotropic means Different properties allow free axis, nine independent constants, wood, concrete, rolled metals, and isotropic. Different properties along crystallographic plane, 21 independent constants. All real life materials are anisotropic only, but uh, we simplify them into category of isotropic or orthotropic. Laminates. Two or more material bounded together in layer. Simplest example is lamination carried out on certificates, identity cards, etc. Mainly used for space application and these days in automobiles the trend is shifted towards plastic and laminates from metals. Material properties for different materials like steel, cast iron, wrought iron and so on. Similarly, the unit systems like length, mass, time, force, Young's modulus accordingly in a different unit system, density and Poisson's ratio. Why mass is in tons and density 
tons per mm cube for newton meter unit system. So one newton is equals to one kg into one meter per second square. So one newton is equals to one thousand uh, kg one mm into second. So one newton is equals to one one kg multiplied by one thousand mm per second. That will lead to one ton into one mm per second square. Hence, when the force is applied in newton, length in mm. Mass must be specified in tons and density in tons per mm cube. So in this way, I have ended with this today's session. Thank you very much for attending this session. Uh, if you have any queries, feel free to ask us at or contact us via edu-support at india.altair.com.